Well, hello, hello, folks. Welcome to our live stream of the Concealed Carry Podcast. We'll get started here momentarily. And I've got Jacob with me on for, you know, first time in a while. Yeah, it's my first time using this new fancy software. Yeah. <clears throat> so hopefully it uh, works well for us again today as it did uh, a couple days ago for me and Matthew. <clears throat> Hey, Everest. So from within here, can we reply to comments or no? Yeah. Yeah. Do you have a little post comment feature right there on the... No. I see comments coming in, but I don't see a way to reply to them or post them. Oh. Yeah. Um, I, I, can, I, can, I can reply right from within this. Hmm. Maybe I have to be like logged in or something. Like I'm not logged in. Maybe I, I don't know how I don't remember how that all works. Yes, Ben, I did wear my shirt just for you, buddy. I, I put this on thinking of you. <laughs> Change. Please stop thinking of Ben when you get dressed. <laughs> I only think about it with this as it, as it relates to this shirt. Or I think in terms of, oh, I'm not wearing Ben's favorite shirt. <laughs> there, there's a confirmation from uh, uh, Trey over at Ghost Tactical saying that only the host can use the, can actually comment from within StreamYard. Oh, now we know. Yeah. I thought that was the case, but yeah, anyway. Um, okay. Cool, cool. It's pretty cool to see those comments come in from YouTube and Facebook both. So our, our YouTube viewership, I'm sure, is still young and fresh and just getting started. <laughs> Today we're going to be talking about how not to mistake your family members and other good good guys inside your home for bad guys and accidentally shoot them. Yeah, it's pretty important stuff. And Jacob's got a thing or two to say about that as well, so... That's that's why we're here. So, let's do it. In three, two, one. This is the Concealed Carry Podcast, episode number 362. And welcome to the Concealed Carry Podcast, part of the ConcealedCarry.com network. I am your host, Riley Bowman, joined by Mr. Company President... <laughs> Founder, CEO, all things glorious and good in the world, Jacob Paulson. Thanks, Riley. <laughs> What's up, dude? It's Friday, you know. It's uh, the rush to get things done. The uh, the 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 pressure and weight of having worked a hard hard long week, and the now pleasure of uh, you know getting to chat. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, by the way, you know my my little like intro of my co-hosts. It, it replaces the the old uh, man who guy who whatever stuff we used to do. So yeah, I'm not sure if it's preferable or not, but at least people are <laughs> getting less insight into my personal life and instead just saying yeah, BS, Riley. <laughs> so welcome today, Jacob and I are going to be talking about how not to mistake your family member or other loved ones or friends. Doesn't matter who. How not to mistake the good guys from the bad for the bad guys in cases of particularly like uh in your home, uh like a mistaken home invasion sort of situation. This happens all too frequently. In fact, more commonly than people probably think. Uh Jacob and I are probably a little bit more familiar with this because we pay attention to these sorts of things and we see a lot of different uh stories and things that come across our desks. People send them to us, all that kind of stuff, right? Plus, Jacob actually put some effort into researching this very thing. Uh, he actually pulled a bunch of different articles and stories to cite as evidence for an article he wrote recently about this very topic. And so that will be the topic of our discussion today. We want to make sure you have a solid home defense plan in place and that you are not going to be one of those that we feature <laughs> as one of these stories down the road. Uh, definitely want to avoid that. This, this sort of thing just, there's no excuse for shooting a loved one thinking it's a bad guy. Well, I I want to make sure we're clear because 
obviously these people don't do it on purpose. Right. 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 And so this is about tactics. And so, yes, there's no excuse uh, to use poor tactics that put you into a position where you're compromised and therefore you make the mistake of shooting someone that is a loved one or friend on accident. And so framing it like that helps put us in the right mindset of understanding this is not about you just being a bad person. This is about you failing to employ proper tactics. Yeah, it's not It's not about that at all. Yeah, it's, it's people make mistakes. And, and, and mistakes are made because of lack of understanding where, where tactics come to play, but also not having a very good home defense plan in place in the first place. And, well, I've got my, my gun on my nightstand does not qualify as a proper home defense plan. But anyway, that's we'll get into that. Uh, today's episode, I actually... Uh, I'm just going to feature Guardian Nation today. Guardian Nation, we hope that you will give it a try, consider it. Uh, check out Guardian Nation at guardiannation.com if you want to see all the details and what be- be- I can't get the words out. What benefits of membership there are and what it has to offer, I would encourage you to do so. And if you just need a little bit of a nudge to jump into the water, you're kind of dabbling your toe in it. Uh, well, make it real easy by trying a 14-day trial at concealedcarry.com forward slash 14-day. Also, this episode is sponsored by Complete Home Defense. Eight and a half hours of video training about how to defend your home properly using good tactics and the right tools. Learn more at concealedcarry.com forward slash CHD for Complete Home Defense. Yeah. It wasn't in the spreadsheet, Jacob. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> it wasn't when I checked. <laughs> it is now. <laughs> I just had to pull, I had to shoot from the hip on the sponsors today because, uh, anyway, uh, we, we're kind of, I'm a little bit frazzled uh, and have been frazzled for a few weeks because uh, we're still in the throes of this making like a thousand shot timers business and uh, sorely underestimating how long it was going to take. <laughs> but here we are on the podcast, doing the best we can to hold it together, but we, one thing we definitely don't want to cut any corners on, again, was, is with this home defense business, Jacob. Uh, so why don't you set the stage for us on today's topic? Yep. So let's first talk about you know the, the why here a little bit. So I, I did do some research. And by research, I mean like I Googled it, right? Like I Googled a couple of different phrases in an attempt to find just news articles, stories uh, of incidents where someone – mistook a family member or friend as a, as a BG and they fired and shot them. Okay. And, uh, you know, obviously by nature of Google search and things, uh, you're more likely to find more recent incidents than you are older ones. So I, I certainly did find some older ones. I went, uh, the oldest one I found was 2012. Um, I found quite a few in 20, 2013, 2014, 2015, et cetera. But just to give you some sense, I found 10 uh, so far, 2019. I did this research in early September, so we were less than nine months into the year when I discovered 10 incidents so far in the U.S. this year. So that's on average more than one a month. Okay. Now, on one hand, you might say that's not a lot, you know, given the number of households out there that have guns, gun, gun, gun ownership in the U.S. On the other hand, you might feel like that's a lot. Oh my gosh, more than once a month in the U.S., a homeowner is accidentally shooting a friend or family member, thinking they're an intruder. Uh, I, I felt like that was more than I expected to find. Um, we, we do see them with, with some regularity. We cover them on the podcast on occasion. Uh, but I, but you know, more than one a month, that was a little surprising to me. I felt like that was a lot. And, and uh, here's, the, here's the truth. If you read these, it changes your perspective. And that's why I do research like this. When, I, when we do this kind of uh, topic and I want to understand it in depth, I do the research to find the stories because – Reading those, in this case, I found about 40 total. Reading those 40 news stories changes how you perceive this. And I'll tell you how it changed it for me. It went from sort of a what's wrong with people, you know, kind of attitude to a ah, I see what's happening. Despite us having good intentions, it's our lack of training or good tactics that puts us in a position where we accidentally are compromised and therefore make mistakes. And so the intent of this conversation is really to address what are the key principles or tactics that need to be employed that minimize the odds of this happening. In other words, if I look at the 40 or 45 incidents that I found, the news stories that I read, and say, hey, what are, are there, if there are five things, five tactics or five principles 
that if the people in these stories had followed these five things, we basically would have eliminated all the problems. Like it would not have happened. And that was the objective here. And, and I don't know if there's exactly five. I think one, two, three, four, five, six, six. I got six things that I really was able to say, hey, if these six things had been done properly, we would have eliminated every one of these news stories. Right. Yep. So, and by the way, we'll make sure that the link to the article that you wrote, Jacob, the title of the article is super clever, I got to say. I mean, geez, pure genius. How to not mistake your loved one as a bad guy and then shoot them. There's actually, I actually, it's funny you, you mentioned that it was genius. I actually really struggled with the grammar on this because there's two different ways to read it. One way to read this would be to say, I'm, I'm trying to say how to not mistake your loved one as a bad guy, but then still shoot your loved one. Like you could read it that way, but that's obviously not what I meant. What I meant was how to not mistake your loved one as a bad guy and, and, and shoot them, right? Like, you know, avoid both <laughs> of the two things. But anyway, I just grammar. Had to, you know, I just had to pick on your your article title a little bit but uh <laughs> yeah, yeah so um let's uh let's go down the list here the first thing here that you list under key key tactics and attitudes is do not go looking for the intruder and this is a hard one uh to be to be quite frank because when you read these news stories the the, in ma the majority of the time it is not a scenario where the homeowner knew there was an intruder initially uh, they they end up in a situation where it turns out that there's someone unexpected. So in other words, it's sort of a, hey, did you hear that noise? I don't know. Maybe. Yeah, I think I heard something. Oh, okay. I'll go check it out. It's not a, holy crap, there's voices downstairs. Uh, those aren't our children. Like, we better shoot people. Like, no, it's, it's generally more, uh, I would call the 80% of situations that normally do not lead to anything bad. I mean, if we're being honest, like, Riley, you and I spend our, our day jobs trying to prepare people for, you know, surviving BG situations. But if we're being honest, I mean, what percentage of the time that my wife nudges me in the night and says, Hey, I heard something. Do I wake up and think, Oh, I better grab my gun. There's something bad in the house versus me saying, mm -hmm, sure you did. Um, probably not, <laughs> you know, yeah. like the, the majority of the time, I obviously don't think it's, an, it's, it's a, it's a person who cried wolf kind of scenario. And so that's what a lot of these news stories are is that kind of situation. So while it's common knowledge, uh, at least if you listen to our podcast, it's common knowledge that we we preach a philosophy of don't go searching for the intruder, right? Isolate the family, defend the room, create a choke point and barricade. That's generally an accepted uh, home defense strategy. But we're you got to understand this is it's not always uh, immediately obvious that there is an intruder. A lot of times it's it's more of the eighty percent of the situations where it's just like ah, I think I heard something. I better go check it out. And that, that can be a problem. So this isn't a one, you know, one stop, this one thing is going to solve all our problems, but there are definitely situations there are definitely incidents that I read where this one thing would have solved the problem, where if the person, the person knew there was an intruder, they heard noise, they didn't know, expect it. And if they had just done this thing, if they had just barricaded, they would have been fine. Mm -hmm. So what do you, I mean, and I realize again, cause you just touched, you just touched on it that Isolate the family defending the room as a strategy uh, is is simplistic, right? And probably doesn't apply to all circumstances, all situations, all people, all households. Uh, so what do you suggest? I mean, imagine, all right, so in my home, it's pretty e easy to do this. And I take an approach of not necessarily isolate the family defend the room, but more like I isolate, I mean, the family's already isolated some, to some extent. We have all of our bedrooms, the entire family, all the kids, me and my wife, are all down a single hallway, and they're all clustered together, right? So there's actually a position in the doorway of a bathroom that where I, I can see down the hallway, I could see into part of the living room, uh, and it's pretty much already, you know, like we're already isolated, right? And so if I need to, I can move to that position, which kind of separates me too from where all the beds are at. In, in the case of if there was gunfire exchange for whatever reason, uh, if someone's shooting towards where I'm positioned in, say, the doorway of this bat bathroom, there's not going to be bullets passing through walls 
and they're, they're, they're going to be, you know, away from where the beds are located. And, and I wish I could say I was like super smart and that's how we, we intentionally laid out the bedrooms and the beds and everything, but it's just actually kind of how it naturally worked best anyway. Um, and so that's kind of how it works for me. But what if you're in a household where you've got your bedroom, maybe you have another bedroom that's clustered with yours, but then you've got another family member, a child, whatever, that's kind of separate from where you are. Uh, I mean, what what is a person to do? I mean, like, but here uh, I think here's here's the point. This this yeah. is not like we have a whole episode about this concept of isolate the family, defend the room. But mm-hmm. for the purposes of this discussion, the point is don't go seek out the intruder. So mm-hmm. here's an example. Uh, you have uh, dad wakes up in the middle of the night, thinks he hears a noise. Uh, dog starts barking. Dad grabs gun. This is a real. This is one of the incidents on on my list, my research list. Um, goes downstairs to where the dog is barking. Dog is barking at a guest room. Okay, no one sleeps in this room. No one's in this room. Uh, before dad goes downstairs, he checks all the bedrooms to verify that the whole family is in bed. And the whole family is in bed. Everyone's accounted for. So go downstairs. Da- dog is now barking at door of guest room. Door is closed. Door is not normally closed. So this is starting to get suspicious. Dad opens door of bedroom. Looks in bedroom. Doesn't see anyone initially. Walks, takes a few steps into the bedroom and gets basically ambushed. A closet in this room gets opened and a dark human-like figure comes out of closet toward dad. Dad yeah. shoots. Right? Dad Dad does not have the time. In that moment, in, in the moment that we, we've identified there's an actual human threat and the human threat is within feet of reaching us, there's not time to identify the threat. So you can talk about safety rules all day long. Oh, you're supposed to identify. You don't have time. The person's on you. They, they, you they're a couple feet away. They're, a, they're, they're, they're going to stick a knife in you even if you shoot them. Okay? So, so dad shoots. Now, in this case, it turned out to be that the, the, the daughter that he had verified she was in bed, she was awake. She had snuck downstairs, let her boyfriend in. They were in the master. They were in the guest room, fit, you know, doing who knows what. I don't want to think about it. Uh, dar- dog starts barking. Oh, dad, awake! You hide in the closet. I'll run upstairs and pretend to be asleep, and I'll come back and get you later. Well, now the boyfriend's dead, right? So, so the issue here is at what point? It's like, okay, I, I hear a noise. I'll go investigate. Dog's barking. Mm, getting more suspicious. Doors closed. It's more suspicious. Open door, dog's still barking. It's still suspicious, right? At what point does the person say, I need to retreat from this? I've crossed the threshold because at some point, you know, yes, in that very moment, the trigger was pressed. You didn't have much choice and I get it, but there were tactics that were poorly utilized that put you into that compromised position. So so the main takeaway here is don't go looking for the intruder. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, you're kind of looking to get into a fight, you know, just the same way we want to avoid a fight outside of a home on the street, in a parking lot, at the store or whatever. Uh, Yes, I I realize that this is your home. This is your domain. This is your castle that you have a right to defend to some extent and especially defend the people within it. But by looking for suspected intruder, you are actually looking for a fight. There, there is, because if your suspicion that there is an intruder, if that is actually correct, if that is actually what is going on, that you have an intruder in the home, by you finding that intruder, there is no way that ends without really, I mean, well, okay, they may choose to leave at that point. They may escape. They may uh you know, lay down on the ground and, you know, like, or hold their hands up in the air because they've now been caught or whatever. Yeah, okay, that's true. But generally speaking, the this is likely ending in some kind of altercation. And that's, you know, inviting additional trouble. So so here's kind of what I think, Jacob. I, I think in terms of, all right, it's really easy in my particular circumstance to already have the family isolated at least that I think, right? So obviously, if I if there's something that happens, and this has happened a couple of times over the years, that where I think that there's something going on, um, very quickly I can peer into the various bedrooms and make sure everybody's where they they ought to be, where where I expect them to be, right? And I could take up a, a position of cover, and that's actually one of your points in your article here. And I have the family isolated, and I'm defending that area of the house, right? 
Now, I might sit there and listen and pay attention to sounds I hear or anything that I might see for several minutes, but then I don't really hear anything. So then what? Sure. Yeah. This, I mean, this right. tactic kind of needs to be combined with some of the other things we're going to talk about, right? But, mm-hmm. but as a core principle, we're saying the same thing, right? Just like we don't need to go searching, and there's got to be some balance and practicality. And I get it that sometimes I just need to go see if the if the dog needs to go outside, or if the dog just puked in the house and is sick, and you know I need to clean up the carpet before the whole house, you know, whatever, right? Like I get it, but there's got to be some degree where we hit a threshold and we say, wait a minute. I need to stop pursuing the shape, shadow, or sound, and I need to start, you know, barricading. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, a uh, good uh, comment from David here, and this absolutely makes sense, I think, uh, in a lot of contexts, uh, saying something to the effect of, you know, who's there? Anybody in the house? You know, you better get out. You better leave. Uh, something along those lines. David here specifically mentions, get out of my house. I am armed. Something along those lines. Um, and we can jump to that next because you know one of one of these key tactics, and sure. I think this is probably one of the bigger ones in in my article, is use verbal commands to de-escalate situations and identify threats. Yeah, um, and this is probably probably one of the bigger ones across these news stories that I read. Is hey, we would have avoided a problem if a verbal command had been given. And not always. Like for example, the story I shared a minute ago. Uh, <clears throat> you know, boyfriend's hiding in closet. Boyfriend does not want dad to know that he broke in to fiddle with his daughter. Right, so boyfriend's going to keep his mouth shut, no matter how many times dad says, "Isn't someone in there?" <laughs> um, but, but, it does make a difference. It, it can make a significant difference. Um, it, again, it's not a universal factor, but we we need to get really good at that because if it is the family member, if it's the brother-in-law, if it's the mother-in-law, if it's the son, the daughter, the spouse, simply saying something like, "Hey, it's Jacob. I'm armed. Uh, I'm prepared to defend myself." Um, if you come up these stairs, I will shoot. If you come into this hallway, I will shoot. Police are on the way. I'm armed. You know, whatever the thing is, then that's probably going to be do a pretty good job of getting the average uh, person to shout out. A, a story that some podcast listeners might be familiar with is a time when my brother almost shot me. I broke into his house uh, to crash for the night. Didn't give him a heads up. He didn't know I was coming. I let myself in. And um, you br- you this- broke in. I, I love how you describe it, though. Uh, I surreptitiously entered, you know, without force. How about that? I surreptitiously entered the house without force. And um, I almost got shot in the back that night. And and this would have been, you know, this one would have solved our problem that night. You know, a simple issue of who's there would have caused me to be like, it's me, Jacob. <laughs> you know, it's your brother. Uh, so <clears throat> that, that, this, that, this is a key one, right? The, the simple verbal command is, is critical in this context. So how did you not get shot that night? Like, what was it that, you know, I I heard, I heard, I heard the footsteps coming down the hallway behind me and I just had, you know, one of those like moments of inspiration. I was like, Oh, that's Jeff. And he's got a gun and he's definitely about to shoot me. (laughs) And so I called out, I was like, Hey, it's me. It's Jacob. And so I preemptively am the one who actually said something. And, you know, as soon as he heard my voice, it, you know, heavy breathing and a sigh of relief and like, Oh geez, thank goodness, man. I, I thought it was someone else, you know? So yeah, that, that's how that one got de-escalated is luckily I was, I was able to say something, you know, mm. get, the, get the words out. Yeah. So ver- verbalizing commands and or intents, uh, warnings, it can be a big, th- I mean, I agree with you that this is probably one of the big things that if done in a number of these situations would not have occurred. Uh, and it goes along with the idea of communication, right? I mean, that's a form of communication. That's a form of communication that's occurring in the moment that definitely, I think, can can save a lot of folks from making mistakes like, like this. Um, another form of communication, actually, Casey brings up a really great point here, a comment on Facebook. She says, I also think you should have a discussion with family and close friends that there should not be any surprises or pranks or sneaking in the house. Well, we could go to that one next. That's on my list. Yeah. So this is another, another one of the, you know, it's kind of the same sort of thing, but this is a, this is a communication that's in advance yep. of something that might happen. And, and I think the biggest place where we fail with this is with guests, temporary occupants. But certainly, you know, broadly mm. speaking, whether it's, uh, you know, my children or my roommate or, you know, or my spouse, you know, certainly, yes, conversations need to be had. <clears throat> Excuse me. But there were several incidents that I read where it was a guest. It was someone visiting 
who's not a normal occupant of the home. And what happens is when there's not a normal occupant of the home, when I wake up at 2.30 in the morning, my brain does not immediately say, FYI, remember, Jacob, you have some guests staying in your house tonight. That doesn't, that doesn't happen. My brain instead says, what, what's going on? You know, and, and it does not even for a second take into consideration that something is out of my normal right? It just reacts. It's, it's the animal brain is, is turned on and we go. <clears throat> and so, you know, doing, doing some things in advance to, to manage those expectations. You know, when there's people in the home, you, you gotta, you gotta talk about your response plan and protocols. And I don't have to do that in depth. I'm not going to grab my in-laws when they come to stay and pull out my battle plan and be like, listen, you know, if this happens, we do this. And if this, you know, those conversations that happen with my children because they live here all the time, my in-laws, that's, I mean, maybe that would be wise, but I'm not going to do it. <laughs> it seems it seems over overly crazy. So, but I am going to say some simple things like, "Hey, FYI, um, if you need to get up during the night, will you make sure you turn lights on? We'd rather have the lights on so that we know uh, who's in the house and we can readily see who's in the house. And uh, you know, if you if you do this, make sure you you do that first or, or whatever, right? I mean, just some simple, a couple of simple tips to help them understand. If you need to leave during the night, <coughs> excuse me, I'm having a coughing fit. If you need to leave during the night and go get a soda from the gas station, uh, no problem. Please use this door when you come and go. Uh, here's a key so you don't have to knock or you go through the garage. Here's the garage code. And when you come in, make sure you leave this light. Uh, you turn this light on when you leave, turn it off when you come back, whatever, right? Some simple things uh, that minimize some issues. Even asking, hey, what time do you plan on waking up in the morning? Oh, you're an early riser. Good to know. How early is it? Four o'clock. Oh, okay, good. Great. You know, so just those simple conversations are going to go a long way. And like I said, uh, good for all occupants of home, yes. But a lot of the incidents where I think this would have been the difference maker is when it was a, a guest, a temporary guest. Mm, yeah, that's a good point. Uh I, th I think especially with our immediate family and our children, particularly our teenage children, because it is it is a thing a lot of times and a lot of for a lot of families where a child gets to those teenage years and maybe they're coming and going later than what they once did when they were children, and and they may even be sneaking in or out of the house. Uh, I, you know, I've got a, a son that's thirteen now, and while I don't think this is really an issue for us yet he certainly knows like you don't go sneaking around in the middle of the night you know <laughs> like for no apparent reason and most certainly i mean this, this is probably a conversation i should just have with him directly as far as if you're gonna do anything stupid don't be sneaking back into the house at 2 a.m uh without like notifying mom and dad sort of thing you know like which is that may not you know like i'm thinking well the point of sneaking in or out is to sneak in or out but he did I mean, they need to understand, like it's it's more than just mom or dad's gonna be angry at you. Like you could get seriously hurt. <laughs> yeah. Now, but one thing though that uh, along with vo vo vocal commands, along with uh, having good communication as well with those that are in our home, visiting our home, staying our in our home. Uh, but one thing we haven't touched yet on yet that is probably a pretty obvious thing. Uh, and you touched on it in your kind of example of talking with a guest that, Hey, if you get up in the middle of the night, you know, feel free to turn on lights, whatever, you know, don't be kind of stumble around in the dark sort of thing. Uh, lights and lighting mm -hmm. is, is a big, big, big thing yep. here. And I can't tell you how many times I've read stories where somebody gets shot and it's most likely because it's dark and they're in the dark and they're shooting it as you know, you, you coined the phrase, the triple S disease, you know, sh shapes, shadows, and sounds, you're shooting at this shadowy figure uh, that is obviously shadowed because it's not lit up. So, yep. you know, let's talk about lights. Yeah, this is on my list of six things. Use light to your advantage. And there's there's two sides of this coin, but before we discuss either, uh, and one side of the coin is what I would call uh, your execution of light via handheld light or weapon mounted light. And the other side of the coin is just you know general house lights, like flip flip on the light switch. But before we dive in there, we have to dispel the, the myth, right? The counter argument. The counter argument to using light is this basic idea of, well, my BG is now going to know where I am, right? I've given away my 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 advantage, my distinct advantage I had in the dark, you know, as I was sneaking through the house and being all James Bond like is now gone because I've turned lights on or I've I've lit up an area. So I think that we have to dispel that that first. <laughs> 
that yes, there are potential situations. Like I will concede that there are potential scenarios where you you being in the dark is an advantage to you. But I think that they they're very small. They're very minute. For the most part, um, you know, being able to see stuff is an advantage. And there's also a difference between like if I have a handheld light and I'm moving through the dark <clears throat> and I'm not doing it properly. If I'm just like you know constant on with that light and I'm just like hey anyone there. Yeah, sure. Like I'm definitely doing a bad job. And there's so there's a different difference between proper use of a light and improper use of a light. And so, you know, I, I get that this this is not the conversation for that. We have uh, almost an hour worth of content in our complete home defense course, all about low light <coughs> uh, techniques, tactics, and 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 tools. But let's just assume that we're doing it properly. So I think that's the first thing to understand is there's a correct way to execute that. And let's, when we talk about just throwing on a home light, like if I just, you know, uh, here's one, here's a news story for you. A lady here's pounding at the door. She comes downstairs. Someone's trying to get through. It's a glass door. They're hitting it really hard. She can't see who it is. They can't see her. Uh, glass breaks. Person comes through door. All right. Well, if the, the porch light had been on uh, or the interior light of the house had been on, then we would have identified who the person was pounding on the glass long before they came through. <clears throat> that seems pretty straightforward. We've had three, right. count them, three incidents. This is crazy to me. Three so far in the last six months incidents where a police officer has showed up at a house to contact the homeowner because a home alarm went off or because of something else. And they identify in the house the homeowner with the gun and start shooting at the homeowner. It's happened three times in the last six months. How would this? How would things change if all the lights had been on, the porch light had been on, the home light had been on, right? So, so it's just a simple issue of if I flip on the lights, do I give away my position? Not necessarily. I'm not saying I'm right here. I'm just saying I'd rather be in the light than in the dark. But they don't know necessarily exactly where I am, only that I've turned some lights. They know I'm there, I suppose, because lights are on now. Uh, but I've not given away my position. So, so anyway, I just want to dispel that it's it's not a huge, massive, big deal thing. Like it, you're, give this idea of, oh, my gosh, if I use a light or I turn on the lights, I give away my position is arguably not true at all. And even if it were, it's, it's, it's probably uh, worth doing because of the great advantages which you gain, which specifically are you can now see them. You know who they are and where they are, and you get to dictate the terms in which that light comes on. If I take a good position to cover, which is also on our list, we're going to talk about this, and then I flip the lights on, yes, perhaps, perhaps they now can find and see me, but I've dictated the terms at which time and where that light is coming on. I've made that decision. So I'm choosing the way this fight is going to unfold. And so, yeah, having the light on is, is a big deal. Uh, and, and, and certainly modern technology also, I mean, it's possible you could open an app on your phone, tap something, and all the lights in the house just come on. You know, I mean, there's a lot mm -hmm. of other ways you can approach this beyond just traditional light switch on, move into this room. Um, but yeah. that said, there's there's no doubt in my mind that you're almost always going to gain more than you lose by just turning on the lights. There's a lot of, you know, these new home integration systems, right? Security system, cameras, lighting, all that stuff where you can control everything from an app, from your phone, from a console. Uh, and, and so certainly all of that could be used in, in a variety of ways, I think, to one's advantage. And keep in mind, as far as to this point that, well, maybe you're giving away your position if now, besides even using like a tactical light, like where you're, you're lighting up something from a light source that's in your hand or on your gun or something, um, where that's probably a little bit more disorienting and really, really, really bright blinding, right? Uh, but the thing is, is if you're using cover and stuff effectively, like you should be anyway, then even if you have all the lights on in the house, if you're using cover effectively, you should be able to see and observe your threat before they see and observe you. Because they're probably not using cover the way, I mean, it's particularly if you've learned how to use cover effectively. Right. right. So, this, so this, that, and that's just it. This is not about, is this general principle good, bad? I mean, it's good, but it's good, especially when paired with just proper tactics, right? So, uh, and, and, you know, we could talk about handheld versus you know, uh, weapon mounted. And that, you know, I think actually we have two episodes of the podcast dedicated to the whole topic of low light, not to mention uh, the mention the section of our course. But mm -hmm. for, for this topic, I, I suffice it for me to say that 
the advantages of having lights on, whatever those lights are, greatly outweigh probably the, the, the disadvantages of having lights on. So turn on the lights. See who's there. Right. Yeah. Yep. Now, if you want to be more tactical about it and use a light, well, in your hand, you know, a handheld or a weapon-mounted light, well, so be it. Sure. Now, I would caution about the weapon-mounted lights, right? Yeah, Wep- especially in a, this context. <laughs> a wep- yeah, a weapon-mounted light is not for the purpose of going around the house and searching the house because you're then flagging everybody and everything in the house with your gun as well, right? Uh, now, there are ways. You, you, can, you can use that light and bounce light off of the floor and the walls and light things up that way without pointing your gun everywhere. But I would still caution you. like If you have a weapon-mounted light, then you should also have a a, a handheld light. Yeah, the correct for, answer for is always both or all, right? Right? Yeah. So right next to my bed and also my quick access safes, you know, people think, well, my quick access safe is for my gun. Mm-hmm. My quick access safe is also for some other tools like flashlights that I want to be in a predictable place always, all the time, right? So my quick access safe is, is my gun and at the very least a handheld flashlight. So that if I'm going to that, I know where my light is. I've got one on the nightstand as well. Okay. Yeah. But I always, always, always at the very least know where one of my where, where one of my handheld lights are. And it's in my quick access safe right there with my handgun. And that is the go to tool for you know, I, by default. I gotta I gotta throw this out there. I mean, I know we're talking about not shooting people on accident, right? But let's just assume you have a real threat. What what happens when you make the verbal commands? With the real threat. What happens when you turn lights on with a real threat? I mean, most of the time, it's going to be a deterrent. You're you're actually putting yourself in a situation where you are you're minimizing the odds odds of you actually being in a gunfight. <clears throat> if the intruder, you know, is a real BG and lights come on, they're going to bell. I mean, the vast majority of them are going to be like, "Oh well, crap, they're awake. I'm out. Someone's more, home. More I'm than out. likely, but more yeah. than likely, right? I mean, there, I'm there's not definitely... saying it's a guarantee, <clears throat> but I'm saying that. We got to remember that all these things are not only meant to be tactically wise to minimize the odds of of shooting someone you shouldn't be shooting, but they're also just good sound tactics, broadly speaking. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, are there any of your points that we haven't covered, uh, based you know from your article? Yeah, two. <clears throat> so one is a simple one, and then we'll get into the big one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, lock your doors and your windows. Just, yep. just lock the doors and windows. Like uh, a large number of incidents that I reviewed would have been resolved if we just locked the doors mm-hmm. and the windows. Now, what you, you can't prevent against is uh, your daughter who unlocks the window so she can sneak in later. Dang that daughter, you know. But if you are locking all the doors and windows, you do prevent against the in-laws or the brother, that annoying brother-in-law or – the you know the the person who's drunk and accidentally comes into the wrong house mm-hmm. uh, because they think it's theirs, um, you know you're, you're you're preventing against all those things that might be unexpected. So just lock the doors and windows. That's going to go a long way. Yeah, um, that's you're right. It's so simple. It's almost stupid, but it's common sense. Uh, I know that there are folks that probably live in areas they think, well, we don't lock our doors around here. Uh, you, you do what you think is best. But again, we're talking about best practices for preventing these accidental misidentifications and shooting of family, friends, and loved ones because we think they're bad guys, right? And so. we, just had, we just had an incident a couple months ago where a police officer, uh, several police officers, uh, broke into a home, mistaken home. They thought they had the address of a criminal, Okay. And they thought they were acting within their authority. They just happened to pick, get the address wrong. So they broke into the home and they, they, they knocked first or something like that. But then they, they let themselves in. And the homeowner who was asleep in the front room, when they, when they breach the house, mm. when they come through the door, he wakes up and starts shooting. And he shot cop. Okay, cop got shot. He's, he was fine, by the way. He did not get shot. The homeowner's fine. But all this probably could have been avoided if the door had just been locked. The door was not locked, right? But if it had been locked, it, had, it would have caused a lot more ruckus for these officers to be able to come in. So anyway, just a simple you know, example that just popped into my head. But yeah, just, just lock the dang door. We just, mm-hmm. had, you know, we just had someone charged uh, with a crime, and they were convicted uh, because a police officer came home after a long shift and let themselves into the wrong apartment, thinking it was theirs, supposedly, 
and then shot the homeowner because they thought it was an intruder in their apartment. They just happened to go through the wrong door. Well, if that person had locked their door, they was and it's not their fault. I'm not saying it's their fault that they got shot by a cop who picked the wrong address. I'm saying that the door had been locked. The incident would probably wouldn't have happened. The person would have said, oh, why is my key not working? Why can't I get into my – oh, crap, I'm in the wrong apartment. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And we've got our – I've got my whole family well-trained on locking doors. Like it's just uh, – during the daytime – you know, where a lot of times maybe there's some coming and going. Like, I, I sometimes find myself getting almost frustrated. I'm like, I just stepped outside to go to the car real quick, and I come back and find find the door locked. You know, it's like, what the heck? But then I have to stop and be like, well, all right. Actually, the kids are just doing what I asked them to do. Like, anytime we go through a door or whatever, like, the door gets locked. Um, and that's just, our, you know, that might be a little bit, in somehow, you know, by some people's standards, uh, maybe a little bit paranoid, but I'd much rather, you know, deal with a little bit of inconvenience of having the door locked than, than not. Yeah. You just know? lock the door. It's, yeah. it does solve, I think a lot of problems. And windows too. I, just to make, yep. reiterate yep. Yep. doors and windows. Cause yep. sometimes, uh, that family member does come through a window. Sometimes your child, you know, lets themselves in through a window and, uh, yeah, you do not want to mistake them as an intruder because, you know, who would sneak through a window? Right. Well, maybe yep. they forgot their keys. Yep. Now, what was the final thing from your article we needed to cover still? Take a position to cover. <laughs> so here's what I see in a lot of these situations uh, and the articles I read. The situation is such that the good guy positions themselves too close to the BG. And so when the attack or supposed attack happens, due to distance, they don't have enough time to identify the threat. So this is one that happened very recently, and I think I might have already mentioned it in context with one of our other six factors, but let me let me mention it now. Um, someone's knocking on the door. A uh, homeowner comes downstairs. It's dark. It's a glass door. They can't see who's, who's pounding on the door, but they're pounding violently, aggressively. They're trying to shout through the door, give verbal commands. That person may or may not be able to hear them very well through the door. It's dark. The outside light is not on. The inside light is not on. A homeowner has gun in hand. If this person comes through this door, I'm going to shoot him. Glass breaks. Person comes through the door. Homeowner starts shooting. Okay. It was her son. Homeowner shot her son. Uh, he was not in a good mental condition. And uh, so he did not have his wits about him. Long story short, he's, he's he was shot. <clears throat> the challenge here is what, what if, you know, we already talked about lights, um, you know, and not being in the dark, but what if mom had said, Hey, someone might come through this door. And when they do, I want to be more than two feet away from them, mm -hmm. right? So I'm going to take a position of cover where maybe I can get 20 feet away from them and I can put um, this, this sofa and this wall and this hallway uh, between me and them. And I'll still be here, the pounding. I'll still hear that glass break, but I'm going to maximize the distance I have, which also will maximize the time I have to identify the threat before I feel like I have to shoot. So the utilization of cover, what happens is two things happen when we use cover properly. The first is that we maximize our odds of not being shot and hurt, right? It's just good tactics regardless in a gunfight to use cover. But second, we buy time. Because we have cover, we maximize the amount of time we have to identify the threat. Mm -hmm. Okay? So that that's that's the big you know key here. Yeah. Uh, that's a great point. You know, I mean – Distance is distance, no matter whether you're behind a door in your home or out on the street. Like, distance is always your friend. So, what would you say? Uh, this is something that kind of that does come up from time to time. Actually, there's a comment here, and I don't know if I'm taking this out of context, but, uh, you know, about like, well, I don't hide in my own house. Like, why would I listen to you guys? Because you're basically saying, don't go looking for the intruder, stay in your bedroom, lock your doors. Uh, isolate the family, defend the room, call the cops. I don't hide in my own house. You know, yep. like, there's, like so it's, there's two sides of this. And, and I actually just replied to someone's comment on our website that was similar to that. You know, they basically, that was their comment. Mm -hmm. uh, one side is sort of this practical application, in which case I'm sympathetic. If, if you're, if you're, if your concern is, well, <laughs> Every time my wife hears a sound in the basement, I'm not going to call the cops, close the door, and barricade the room. Like that sounds <laughs> – the cops are going to get really pissed at me after a while, right? I'm going to create a boy who cried wolf factor with the police. Yes, valid, true, legitimate. Mm. 
so so I I get that right to some degree we can't treat every little bump in the night like it's uh, you know assassins are in our home we do have to be somewhat practical so <clears throat> I'm I'm sympathetic to the idea that yes this 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 broad stroke idea of don't go searching for the sound just barricade your house has to have some context um, but I also have to know where to draw the line I have to be able to wake up and say okay <clears throat> sure dear it's always my wife who hears something because I sleep really well <laughs> Sure. <clears throat> so if this is nothing against my wife, only that she's the one who's a light sleeper and is more likely to hear the bump. <clears throat> so I wake up and I'm like, sure, I get it. We got two dogs. I don't hear any barking, but whatever. I'll go check. So <clears throat> grab gun, grab light. I'm walking around, you know, dang near in the buff here. And I, I'm going to use some proper tactics, even though I think there's nothing there. Even though there's probably nothing there, I'm still going to follow some good tactics. I'm still going to make some verbal commands before I enter a room. I'm still going to throw lights on. I'm still going to use cover as I move through the house to maximize my odds of not walking into an ambush. I'm still going to do everything right because even though I may not isolate the family and defend the room and barricade and call cops, I'm still going to do these other things that maximize my odds should there be an issue. And these things cost me nothing to do. So that's the first answer to this comment. If, if the comment is given in the context of that's not practical, then my response is, you're right. It may not be practical all the time. And so I, 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 I don't, I'm not going to do IFDR every single time we hear, we think we hear something. You know, there could be a raccoon on the roof that happens in, in, in my house sometimes. So yeah, I'm I'm gonna I'm I'm not gonna do that every single time. I'm gonna do what's most practical. But I'm also gonna look for the signs, right? And if I if the dog's barking at the guest room and the guest room door is closed and no one's responding, that might be the time I do need to cry wolf, right? That might be the time I need to retreat from the the shape shadow or sound, and I need to barricade, or I might discover a voice. It's like, oh crap, that is not my kids. And now I need to retreat. I need to barricade. I need to IFDR. <clears throat> so that's the first step. Now, if, if the comment is given in the context of it's my house, the whole house is my safe room. And when you have violated my privacy, I am going to shoot you because I am not a coward. I should not have to hide in my own home. If that's the context of the comment, then that I say, you are not getting it. Your mindset is wrong. It is off. And I could not disagree with you more because we have to decide as gun owners if, what our, our defensive mindset is going to be. And if it is a defensive mindset by definition, that means that your objective is to survive. Your objective is to defend yourself and loved ones from a threat. <clears throat> and that does not make you a coward. That does not make you a coward. Now, if your mindset is one of uh, administering justice and ensuring that criminals and BGs pay for their crimes, that is not a defensive mindset, okay? That is, that is a reckless mindset. That is a mindset in which you're basically saying, even if it's not my best odds of surviving and protecting my loved ones, I'm going to do what's necessary to make sure this person finds justice. There's two problems there. The first one is that you are disregarding the best best practices to protect yourself and loved ones. And the second problem is that you are bypassing our legal system and deciding that you know best who deserves what punishment. And both of those are reckless and bad. So it's not cowardly to say, I am going to hide in my own home. I am going to take a defensive posture, let this person ransack my valuables as long as I know me and my family have maximized our odds of surviving. And I do that by putting ourselves in this very secure, barricaded place where I've created a choke point that the BG has to come through in which they will not survive because I've set all the all the elements of this gun gunfight in my benefit, right? I have set it up on my terms and I've maximized my odds of winning. That's not cowardly. That's just smart. Mm -hmm. Sorry. I just, just yeah. I, I'm on this one. So my response would be similar, but uh, in a lot fewer words. Uh, and purely from like a tactical standpoint, if you actually truly have an intruder in your home, it, it doesn't matter anymore that it's your home. Okay. Like, and, and so like we have to get that, we have to set that attitude aside it doesn't matter because tactically it doesn't matter, right? You have an intruder in the home, something's going down. It does not matter. What I mean by that is that it, they're occupying that space. 
they're somewhere in there. And for me to go and in search of them and to clear my house out because this is my house and my domain, tactically, that's not the smartest decision to do. Again, yeah, in the context of everything that we're presenting today on this episode, and Jacob, you just did did so quite well in your in your own response. It's about maximizing our chances for success. And so the fact that that it's your home doesn't matter. It has no relevance on whether you tactically uh, will succeed or not, right? So you, you, by the way, you've already failed in some regard by the fact that they've now gotten into your home. Yeah. Right. You you've already failed somewhere somehow. Uh, you and you could do all these different things. You could have a security system. You could have I don't know reinforced fenced, doors and big yeah, dogs you know, and sure good lighting. The, the, the fact is that if they uh, have made it into the house, they've they've somehow gotten past all that. So you've still failed. Your objective of keeping people out that you don't want in the house that you didn't succeed in that objective. So at this point, it just simply becomes. A, well, at least a potential battle. And so you've got to maximize your success for that situation. Uh, it could be their house for all you know at that point. Like it, it's, it is now a mixed domain. It's irrelevant. Um, yeah. so, so anyway, using light, using cover, using verbal commands, uh, all of that I think starts to become so important because we got to decide – what's going on we have to figure it out we have to solve the problem uh and then we got to use tactics that are sound that are going to allow us to not become a, a victim and to become a target now um i was actually thinking about casey here made a comment about you know she's not sure if she wants to give verbal commands because she's afraid that would give her give give it away that she's a woman and that might I guess I, I'm assuming if I'm reading you correctly here, Casey, that that might you're thinking that that would embolden them. They'd be like, "Hey, this is a lady. Like, we can do whatever." Um, that could be right. Um, so, I mean, you, you got to make everybody's got to make their own decisions for themselves. Sure, it's just, I, it's I, just you know, I, I would add, Casey. I'm not disagreeing with you, but I guess my my feedback or my comment would be, it's it's not it's often not what is said, but it's how it's said, and so. I think criminals are pretty good at picking up on a voice that says, I am not a victim and I will bust you. Uh, I will, I will take care of you. I will do what is necessary. You will not succeed here. Um, if you, if you, if you're not compliant, if you don't leave now, if you, if you come up the stairs, if you come into this hallway. So I'm not saying necessarily you're wrong. I'm saying that uh, it's, it, you know, on a case by case basis in the context of everything else going on, I don't think you should rule out verbal commands completely. I think that there's mm -hmm. still probably scenarios where it's an appropriate tactic. So let me start to kind of wrap this up, at least from my viewpoint, with just a, a kind of a description of how I would personally implement these things myself. And this has happened, okay? So uh, let's just say I'm awakened in the night, and I don't know what it is. Something clearly startled me. I heard something somewhere in or around the house. I'll walk you through everything step by step. The first thing I do is I jump up and I might actually look through the front windows, right, for my bedroom. Because my, my room faces the street. So, okay, peek out through the blinds carefully. And a couple things I'm looking for. Do I see anybody out there or anything, right? Uh, do I see a vehicle parked on the street that looks like it doesn't belong? I mean, our, our neighborhood's pretty predictable, okay? So I know exactly, I know my, my, my neighbor's vehicles. I know where they park. Uh, yeah, there might be a visitor, but, you know, I'm looking, okay, is there a getaway vehicle? Is there a driver sitting out? You know, is a vehicle sitting there running because they're going to bust into this house, steal some crap, rough some people up, and then they're going to get out of Dodge? I don't know, you know? So point is, is like, it's all about taking information. By the way, as I'm doing this, peering out the windows, I'm also listening, Right, I'm, I'm being as quiet as I can, and I'm just trying. I'm I'm, ta I'm taking in visual and auditory information. What is going on? I'm trying to decipher that. Okay, this all only takes, by the way, a couple seconds. Right, quick peek. I'm listening. All right, and then, depending on the situation, depending on how urgent I think it is, I may at that point just run and you know check the kids' rooms really fast. Okay, before I'm even, I'm not grabbing a gun yet. Now. 
it could be that I do choose to grab a gun because I go, ooh, something's going down. Because that's going to be based on what I th- I heard or think I heard or I see or whatever. But uh, my, my next priority is to make sure that my children are safe and that they're where I think that they ought to be. All right, so I've checked that out. At that point, I'm either retrieving a firearm if I still think there's an issue, or maybe I've already retrieved the firearm. And it is being carried in a low-ready, typically one-handed, uh, you know, I'm just basically carrying it low, you know, one-handed. It's not pointing any, anywhere, fingers off the trigger, I'm not doing anything with that gun right? The other hand, it's got my flashlight. Searching, checking the kids' rooms. Okay, all right, kids' rooms are clear. And then I'm taking up a position, as I've described, where I have a natural choke point in my home, and I, I have the family isolated, ready to defend, and I can very quickly see anything that's going to come that way. Now, I might sit there for a minute or two, and again, I might just listen for a moment. Do I still continue to hear noises? If I do at that point, I may go ahead and call out. Who's there? Who's in my home? Right? Get out. That sort of thing. And maybe at that point you hear somebody leave. Maybe you don't. Maybe noises cease. Uh, and you don't you still don't know what's going on. All right. Now, if you at this point, maybe you've determined somebody is or was in my home, it's probably a good idea to start initiating that 911 call, right? Where I can I can either have that have my phone with me. But most of the time, I've got my wife already on top of that. And then let's just say that maybe I've made a decision. I don't know for sure if there's actually something going down. Uh, so I've listened for a minute. I've observed. I've given it a few. Like, usually time is a, is a thing too, right? Like that's something we should probably talk about. Just giving it some time, right? Now that you have a position of cover, you have a position of defense, uh, just giving it time. Listen, and try, as you're trying to take in more information, what was it that I heard? What did I think I heard? Is there anything else, you know, that I'm adding to, I'm, I'm building this story, right, of what's going on, trying to fit in these pieces. And after giving it some time, you'll fill more pieces. Or maybe you don't. And, and may, maybe because that's a lack, because of a lack of information. I no longer hear anything else. And I have called out and I didn't hear any response a response. I didn't hear any movement. I didn't hear any additional noise. So maybe this is all just made up in my head. But after giving it some amount of time, five minutes, whatever you think is reasonable, at that point, I might go, okay, I think I just heard something. I imagined it. Whatever it was, is raccoons digging in my trash. Who knows, right? You know, it could be all kinds of things. At that point, I may go ahead and move down the hallway, move into the living room and check things out while I'm being tactically sound, using cover, all that sort of stuff, turning on lights, et cetera, et cetera. See how that, so like there, we don't have to necessarily be in a rush too, to, and that, that'd be another thing too that I would just throw out to, as a, if I was to add anything to your article, I would say time, like give it some time, right? Allow things to develop right? If I jump up because I thought I heard something and I'm running down the hall and I'm checking rooms and I'm looking everywhere, like what's going on? Like you're not, you're, you're rushing into a situation. You don't know what you're rushing into. If you have a position of defense, you have cover, you have light, you have, you have so many advantages, right? And by you just rushing into, I don't know, do whatever it is you do as you search your house, like that's not necessarily tactically sound either. So giving it some time as you take in visual and auditory information, that's going to start painting the picture and you'll be able to solve the problem. All right. Yeah. I I thought of one more thing that probably should be in my article, but it's not. But I I, I remember at least two news stories. I was just kind of scrolling through and one of the headlines of the incidents. And by the way, guys, all the news stories I researched are at the bottom of the article. So if you go to the link in the show notes of the podcast of today's episode uh, and you scroll down to the bottom of that article, you'll see all the stories. I've I've linked them all in there. And uh, I just saw one of the headlines that reminded me of something I probably should have put in there. But I, I think there was at least two incidents. I know for sure at least the one, but I think there was two incidents where the, the narrative is something along the lines of in bed, asleep, wake up, see dark shadow, grab gun, shoot now. And <clears throat> that's a tough one because it really does almost create a scenario where there are no tactics to employ. The threat is on you now, right? Mm-hmm. If it's really truly a threat, 
if it's really truly the BG, it's they're on you now. And and you basically you all the tactics you could have or should have employed hope would have kept that person from getting to that point. Right. It would have been securing the home better so they don't, can't break in. It would have been setting up uh, some things in place so that they couldn't get that far to you asleep in your bed, standing over you at night. But that said, I don't think I can think of a single scenario ever where there was an actual true life threatening situation where someone woke up and that was the scenario. They had to just grab gun and shoot. But I know of at least two scenarios where that happened and it was not a real threat and they shot a loved one. And so I guess, you know, there's the old adage of, you know, how do you store your gun at night? Is it in a safe or is it just sitting under the pillow or in the nightstand? And putting it in something that I got to open causes a little bit more cognition, right? It's, it's going to cause me to be a little bit more awake and recognize what's in front of me if I got to punch in a combination or at least open a drawer or something. And we have a whole episode of the podcast dedicated to the topic of, uh, keeping a gun in a nightstand and, and a significant amount of research was done for that one as well. And you can go listen to it or read the, mm-hmm. the corresponding article. But I guess that'd be my last thought is forcing some cognition in order to retrieve and deploy the gun is also probably a good thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I don't disagree because again, this is all about a measurement of risks, right? As is the case with so many things in life. And the likelihood that you have somebody that's able to get into your home all the way down to wherever you're, wherever you it is you sleep and be right over top of you. And it's only then that you wake up and you have literally zero time. That, that is a pretty unlikely scenario. It has happened. I could definitely, I, 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 in fact, I can think of one situation where a woman, that was basically the situation. Her and her husband are getting beat or stabbed or hammered or something in their beds and she is able to get to her gun and she fires shots and unfortunately it's like a five shot revolver and she she fires all her shots and she's out and like it, and still gets beat up more you know after that fact it's like a, one of the lessons i've sort of saved in my in my list of bookmarked stories of like well why capacity actually can be a thing sometimes but anyway um, but that's a pretty unlikely scenario right and and there's so many of these other things that we have to consider and i agree with you in fact David here asks or says, people always forget to talk about the adrenaline dump you receive when something like this happens. Well, since David says we always forget to talk about it, I will just mention it really fast. (laughs) It's true. Uh, And I shared, this is the early days of the podcast, where we had an incident with a neighbor that over a period of several weeks, that neighbor had vehicles vandalized again and again and again because of a spiteful person. That had a, a, a you know a bone to pick with with uh, their daughter, and several times I was awakened from a dead sleep in the middle of the night, and because of how that was perceived in my sleepy state, sounded like something was going on with my house, right? And it's true. I mean, I and I experienced adrenaline dumps then too because you when you don't know what's going on, something. But but something is going on. In this case, in one incident, they believe it was a mag light. Okay, one of those good, solid, you know, three or four battery mag lights that was used to beat in tail caps, headlights, windows, side windows, mirrors of my neighbor's vehicle. It was loud, and it scared the crap out of me. And adrenaline did dump into my system as I tried to figure out what was going on. I did grab my gun. But by the time I got to that point, I was starting to kind of come to my senses as far as something's going on. I still don't know quite the full picture, but I am at least beginning to, what's the word? I don't know. Think, I guess. Cognate. (laughs) Is that a word? Cognate? Mm, Sounds good I to me. I doubt it, but I think, I think you've communicated the point well. You know what you mean. Yeah. I'm, 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 I'm going to make up words because it, it sounds good. This is the Riley word. Cognate. Anyway, so I, I agree. That's a good point. And it's time for us to kind of wrap it up here. But I hope that there was some information in this episode today that is helpful for somebody out there, hopefully many of you out there, as you give this some thought. As you maybe read the article, it was shared in the uh, uh, in the comments on the Facebook and YouTube broadcast. It will be in the show notes of the published podcast episode. I encourage you to read that and also read some of those stories 
because that is where for me it it starts to like drive some of that home because you, you you think like wow like what if i was in that situ excuse me in that situation what if i was experiencing that how would i have responded and mm -hmm. how can i now craft a plan for how to respond to something like that this is why i like these various justified save stories that we cover on the podcast or why we we, you know, why, why we cover some of the stories that maybe are not necessarily justified saves, but they're similar to like what we're talking about here today, lessons learned, things like that. It's it, for me, it gives me food for thought to go. This is something that actually happened to a real person. And while that exact thing may not happen to me, it's still an example of something that could happen. And there's things in those stories that you go, I would never have thought of that in a million years. So now I can actually begin to craft a plan that helps prepare for some of those uh, potential circumstances and how I could be better prepared for them. And I, I would add that anytime we do an article or a research piece where you know we've 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 gone through news stories and we're now providing conclusions, very few things in life will be as valuable as just reading all those stories. A, a couple of years ago, we did an episode called uh, something like 300 negligent discharges." And I know we're out of time, so I'm not going to drag it out. You can go find it, but. You, you could read our article all day long and never get as much value as if you just went and read all 300 news stories. And similarly here, I appreciate everyone's listening to our conversation about this issue, but I promise you reading the 45 news stories that we research for this topic, it will impact you more than anything else. Mm -hmm. uh, that That's where the game changes is when you actually put yourself in their shoes over and over again. It it That'll change you. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. Again, uh, today's episode sponsored by Guardian Nation and also by our complete home defense video training course. Whether you want to purchase or view the DVD version or the online streaming version, both are available. Both, I think, reasonably priced considering the like eight hours of training content that we worked really hard to put into that complete home defense training video. Uh, we spent three days at a house we rented just filming, filming, filming some long days too. And I was like sick the whole time. <laughs> in fact, <laughs> the scenes we filmed later on, I think in the, in the uh, uh, series there, I, I, my voice probably got worse and worse as it went on. But anyway, uh, we worked really hard on complete home defense. So anyway, if you haven't watched or had the opportunity to check that out yet, uh, head on over to concealedcarry.com. Do we have a short link for that, Jacob? Concealedcarry.com forward slash CHD. Yeah. Um, there you go. So hope that you'll support us and the podcast by supporting our sponsors and or products that we promote. A lot of times they're our own and your purchase helps support everything we do here at concealedcarry.com and the Concealed Carry podcast. Well, we're going to wrap up this episode for today. Thank you, Jacob, for uh, talking the, about this topic with me here today and everybody online with us. I thought it was uh, really good. And uh, yeah, I, I, there were some, definitely some things that I kind of took note of as we discussed that I'm like, hmm, I should give that some more thought in my own personal home defense uh, plan. Yeah, always valuable. Yep. Well, with that, we'll wrap it up and uh, remind you all to train right, train often, and train safe so you can fight hard, fight fast, and fight true. Take care. And there we go. That's a wrap on the recorded audio. Uh, we do need to give away to our Facebook and I guess now YouTube live viewers. Today's giveaway is a little can, quite literally a little can. It's only 0.44 ounces. But I still have my original one that I got like three years ago, Jacob. So it lasts a while. I mean, yeah. it's not like I have to use this all that often. You're really you, burying the lead here, aren't you? Yeah. So quick draw. I'm sorry. The, the uh, bottom here <laughs> is like trying to uh, pop out here. I'll go ahead and pull the can out. Ah, There we go. This is what it looks like. Quick draw. Get it facing the camera there. There we go. So you pop off the lid, just has a little spray applicator. All right, really easy to use. Great for cleaning holsters, uh, lubricating things. I found that it made my draw stroke very consistent uh, with just regular, and by regular, like once in a, honestly, in a great 
you know, while I, I will use this in my holsters. It doesn't seem like it has to be used that often. Um, benefits of using quick draw, decreases drag for a faster draw time, helps the feel of the gun in the holster, <laughs> protects the finish of your firearm from micro abrasions, mm. resists static and dust buildup. Ooh. That was actually something I was talking about uh, a couple days ago when we introduced this as the weekly podcast giveaway. And I'm like, I know I read that somewhere, and it's it's right there. I just was missing it on the package. Extends the life of your holster, and it's safe for Kydex, leather, nylon, and plastic holsters. And says over 50 applications based on two pumps per application. So that's what we're going to give away right now, this can of Quick Draw. So, what we're gonna do is pick randomly from those that have commented on both Facebook and YouTube. I have to do it by comments now, Jacob, because there's not like a way for me to really see YouTube shares. <laughs> mm, right, sure. Yeah. So, here we go. I need a drum roll. Uh, you know I'm bad at this. By the way, during the whole podcast, it sounded like there, you were drum rolling at times. You were like pounding the desk there. <laughs> I was getting pretty passionate there. <laughs> All righty. The winner is Matt Albrecht. Hopefully, he's still watching. Matt Albrecht is our randomly selected winner. Matt, you have approximately one minute to respond. Say that you are here and you claim your prize for this week's giveaway of the Quick Draw. Lubricant protectant for holsters and firearms. All right. So we'll give him just a moment here. <clears throat> and actually, there's a little plastic cap on the bottom of this that popped off for some reason. Got that back in there. All right. Mr. Albrecht. Mark's here. <laughs> Didn't call yeah. your name, Mark. <laughs> David asked what happened to machine gun drum roll. Well, what happened is I don't have my usual podcast set up like I do at home because I've been working from the office location every day, and I just haven't felt like setting that all up the same way. So I don't have do, my sound. A, if, is there an email? We got a, a comment from someone who said they hated it. I don't remember that. Was it a review on it? I can't remember. But we have like I, one person out there who just hates the machine gun. Yeah, drum one, roll. one person against like 100 that love it. Apparently. <laughs> Michael, reloading 9mm while I watch. Yeah, so still haven't se seen anything from... Sorry, what was his first name? I know his last name was Albrecht. Or Albrecht. A-L-B-R-E-C-H-T. I'm trying to pull up his name again here. Matt. Either way, yeah. he hasn't responded. I think it's on okay. the next one. On to the next, then. He'll be sorely disappointed if he learns that he just missed out. Okay. Another one. Here we go. I will go with... Come on. It's just taking a second here. Hang on. Kenneth Wayne Rogers. Kenneth Wayne Rogers. Kenneth, if you are still viewing... You have about a minute to claim your prize here of Quick Draw. All right, Kenneth Wayne Rogers. You do need to comment. Say you're here and you claim your prize. All right, or I'll have to move on to another one. <sighs> I have a busy weekend ahead of me, Jacob. Tomorrow we have uh, a uh, performance to attend. Okay. Horse riding that right. my daughter is involved with. Yeah. yeah. And then our church has a Halloween party. Ah, uh, we did ours last week. Yeah. So <laughs> Kenny Rogers. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, yeah. So busy day. Busy, busy, busy day. Mm -hmm. And of course, as you know, Sundays are always busy for us too. We He's here. Claimed. Sweet. Awesome. Congrats, Kenneth. I am glad that uh, I didn't have to call another one. So Kenneth, here's the deal, buddy. It uh, looks like you are on Facebook. So uh, message our Facebook page. Okay, it's super easy. Uh, you can just go to our Facebook page and click message. 
Uh, I think actually we have a button that says get started. And if you click that, it'll automatically open up the message panel thing and just send us a message saying, hi, I'm Kenneth and I won quick draw on today's episode of the podcast. And then our customer support team will then be able to uh, get your address information to ship this out to you. All right. So there you go, Kenneth. Congrats, Kenneth, on winning a canister of quick draw lubricant. Very, very cool. And David, I have no intention of buying a horse anytime soon. <laughs> Maybe one day. Maybe when I have the property for it or something. I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. Cool, guys. Well, thanks for watching today. And uh, we'll be back here next week, Monday with Shop Talk. And on Tuesday, I think we have to change the time of the, of the podcast. Because it looks like, Jacob, you and I have a meeting at 1230. Um, I know I got I know I got a calendar invite today. I'm not mentioning. Oh, for, uh, I'll call that optional for you, but yeah, probably wise if you're there. I'd like to be there. Yep. So, folks, I think we're gonna try to do the podcast on Tuesday earlier than normal, like 11 a.m. Mountain Time or something. Okay, so stay tuned. I'll try to have an update on. I'll try to mention that on Shop Talk on Monday. But anyway, we're gonna sign on out of here. Take care. Have a great weekend. Be safe, folks. We'll see you next week.